Uh, in a couple weeks, I say a couple weeks um, because I have one more I feel led of the Lord to teach next week, and then we're going to round out this series on um, the only doors that you're responsible to open or close. Because your responsibility is not to go open doors. Your responsibility is to position yourself in such a way that when God opens doors, because he is the door, then you can walk through in faithfulness. You take a lot of pressure off of your life when you realize, I, God did, said this, you know, I've heard, I know that none of that has anything to do with my ability to make any of it happen. And quite frankly, if you feel confident in your ability to make your vision happen, your vision isn't God's vision for you. Because God's vision for you is big enough and grand enough for your life that he will do things and take you places and open up doors that you never could have got opened. But you don't get it by striving. You get it by waiting. You get it by trusting. And that's why a lot of people, a lot of believers, uh, uh, well-intended, good-minded folk never end up walking in the things that God has for them because they're, they're so busy focusing on what they have and not who he is. Because what I have is never enough. It'll never be sufficient to go do God's call on my life. What I have is a promise. That's what I cling to. And and, and it's who I have that I cling to. Remember, it's not what 2022 holds. It's who holds 2022. That's why I can say to you, this is the year for our church in your lives All of you that are a part of this congregation, God is going to open doors for you this year because he said he would through the prophetic word. Now that means he is going to do things that are faster and bigger than you could expect him to do. So you got to be faithful to wait on him and be with him. Because when he said it's go time, it's go time. God doesn't mince words and he doesn't waste time. Everything he does is strategic. Okay, He's not interested in anointing you to watch Netflix. He's interested in anointing you to go do the works of Jesus. So if you're not going to go do the works of Jesus, he loves you. You're a son or a daughter. He wants to bless you. To the degree that you obey, he can bless you, right? Um, But he's not going to pour out the spirit on you the way that you're begging him to if you never, ever say, God, once you feel me, I'll go out and preach or I'll go lay hands. You don't have to be called behind the pulpit full time, but you are called as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And if the church of the living God decided one day that it would just be the church and act like the church with the spirit of God living in me that raised Christ from the dead, then all of a sudden we'd walk around and see more of the miracles that that a lot of people in the church tell us don't exist, right? God didn't change. You know why men have changed the doctrine over time is because at some point they quit waiting on him, spending time with him, fellowshipping with him, and therefore they didn't see the things because there was no relationship anymore. It was the letter of the law. And then when healing doesn't exist, I have to tell you at some point it isn't theological anymore because I have to explain why we never have it. At some point I have to tell you that the gifts have ceased because they have ceased in our church. Does that make sense? And so at some point down the way, Jesus said, you've made the word of God of no effect because of your tradition. All right. So everybody quotes Isaiah 55 and they say, Isaiah 55, 11. All right. I'll never forget God just hitting me with this reality of that verse. Every time I've ever heard it preached, heard it quoted, myself included at the time, it was God, God's word never returns uh, void, right? In your life, God's word will never return void in your life. That's not what the scripture says. The scripture says God's word will never return unto him void. It is possible for it to return void to you. How? How is that possible? Where's the proof? Jesus said, because of your religion, because of your traditions, because of your philosophy, your theology, your man-made ideas, the word can return void in your life. Is the word void? Is the, no. Is the power of God void? No. But will the power flow in a place where all of us say the Holy Spirit doesn't move and we're not even expecting him to do anything? That's where deadness comes in. And where deadness, where there is no spirit, that's where you get religion. That's where you get denomination. That's where you get long term. And I'm not speaking against any group or denomination. But denomination isn't the kingdom mindset. It's we agree together. We've had an experience. This is what we base our theology on. And because of it, this is all we're going to accept. Does that make sense? So if God wants to do anything different to mess with my paradigm, I'm not open to it. 
And I'll tell you this, if you're going to walk with the Holy Spirit, he will mess up your paradigm on a consistent basis. He will never contradict his word. Okay, we test every spirit, right, in 1 John. So if something's happening in our life that's unbiblical, well, we know that's not the Lord. We don't receive. Jesus said, my sheep will hear my voice. You don't have to worry about hearing the wrong voice because if you're close enough to the master, you'll know his voice as the shepherd. That's his promise that you'll hear my voice. All right. So I don't have to worry about that. But if I am so busy in myself and not in the flow of what he wants to do, see prayer, prayer is connecting me with God's will being done in my life. God is, God has his will done. Okay. The difference is, is his perfect will for you being accomplished in you because you've yielded to the degree that you said, God, if it messes up what I'm used to, I'm okay with that. God, if it doesn't look anything like what I'm used to, I'm okay with it. You only grow when you're willing to say, I submit all my experiences to the truth of your word. I submit all the teaching I've ever heard from every pastor, from every seminary or cemetery or whatever they're called, from every place that I've ever heard them, right? Okay. And there's a lot of good schools out there, right? But my point is, sometimes what happens to us is we just have this passionate, you know, we don't even know better. We just love Jesus because we got saved. He saved me. He delivered me. He set me free. Remember, you were singing to him in your car. You were telling people about him. And then all of a sudden, you went to church. And somewhere, somebody taught you that this doesn't happen anymore. This doesn't exist. You shouldn't lift your hands. Women, you shouldn't wear that, right? In other words, at some point, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you neither enter into the kingdom nor do you yourselves go in. You don't, you don't enter in, nor do you allow others, excuse me, to go in. So the Pharisees, not only were they not entering into the deep things of God, they were preventing other people from going too because of their teaching, right? So Isaiah 22, 2, that's how we open this series. I just want to refresh you for a moment. Then I will set on his shoulder the key of the house of David. And when he opens, no one will shut. Okay, can we put that up, Heath, when you get a chance? All right. Uh, when he shuts, no one will open. So we saw in the very beginning of our series that it is the Lord Jesus Christ who opens or closes the doors that no one can shut. Doors can open for you in your life and they not be from God. Right? We don't want good opportunities. There's a lot of good opportunities that I've passed on along the way, and God set me up with something that didn't look as good in the beginning, but it was God, and so I obeyed it. And long term, it pays off because I'm playing the long game, not the short game. If you think about proper investing, right? You don't invest in the market now and immediately short sell everything the minute something happens. The long term investors that make any money over time are ones that played it for 20 years and they, were, they had stability. Does that make sense? So in the same way, I'm not short selling all right, my opportunities because I got to have it now. That's the thing with the church. We're all microwave in our Western culture, and we need everything right now. But that's not how God works. So we got to get on his timeline because his timeline is not, you know, we always say, well, God is never early, but he's never late. Okay, right? And his timing isn't our timing, right? His t God's timing isn't my timing. No, it's the other way around. My timing is jacked up because it's not on God's time because I don't discern his clock and his timing in my life half the time, right? So I'm busy trying to get God to line up with my clock. And the truth is I need to line myself with his clock. And how I do that is by spending time with him and waiting on him, fellowship with him, uh, with him being in the word. So we know that the house of David, meaning the kingdom, the things to the kingdom is on his shoulder. And when he opens, now here's the thing. If you open the door, you have to keep it open. If you get the door open, you got to do everything you did to get it open. You got to do more than that to keep it open. So not only do you have to pressure yourself, stress yourself, wear yourself out to get the door open, then you have to do all that plus times 10 just to keep it flowing. That's why we got to drop Easter eggs out of a helicopter at some point in our parking lot, because if we get it going in the natural, we got to keep it going in the natural. And where the spirit of God is, I don't have to keep it going other than I just keep like John laying my head against the chest of the Lord and going, okay, what's on your heart, Jesus? What's on your heart, Lord? Because the whole, I can't do it. I can't do it. If you think you can do it, you just haven't gotten to the place yet of humility where you realize Jesus said, I am divine. 
You're the branch. You can do nothing outside of me. Nothing of any good. Now, are there things you can do without the Lord's help? Absolutely. People do it all the time, every day. Is any of it going to matter in eternity? And that's the ticket. That's the thing. Jesus is saying anything you produce outside of me is worthless. It can look good. You can have an entire orphanage for kids, okay, and be a Hindu and raise uh, uh, children in an orphanage. And guess what? You'll still split hell wide open because you rejected Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? So it doesn't matter. There are people in this life that do more charity than I'll ever be able to do because they have billions of dollars to do it. And yet they will stand before the great white throne judgment one day because nothing they did. If Oprah doesn't repent one day, okay, and say there is no other way to God but Jesus Christ, one day with all her billions, with all her reputation, with all her connections, with all her ability to sway the minds of people, she will stand before the ultimate judge. Because it wasn't done in Jesus. I don't care what you accomplished. I don't care how many cars you gave away and what you did. If you didn't do it in and through him, it's worthless anyway. And what I want you to see tonight is the only door we're believing God to open is the one that he has for us. All right? When doors fling open in other places or they shut in other places, you shouldn't get worried about it. You shouldn't get upset about it. Jesus said worrying doesn't add anything to you, correct? Correct? Okay, you can't do anything for yourself. What can you do within your own strength where you actually add anything to your own life? Can you add a minute to your lifespan? That's what Jesus was saying. You have no ability to do any of that. So trust me, trust me, the Lord, for you that I know what's best for you. How many times have you as parents in here, if you're a parent, how many times have you okay, had a situation with your child where they didn't understand what you were doing and didn't like what you were doing, but you were doing it for their good. And ultimately you say, well, mom and dad know better and we're doing this for you. What's best for you? You can't see that right now, but this is exactly what we're doing. God cares enough about you that he won't let you get into certain things that you should, or when you try to do something, you don't get away with it like everybody else did because he chastises us and deals with us as sons and daughters. And the Bible says we shouldn't reject the chastening. See, that's not a thing we like very much. We want to talk blessing, but we don't like chastening. Okay? And yet it's the discipline. A loving father disciplines his sons. Okay? So God also disciplines us and allows us to go through situations to forge in us the character and the integrity that we need to when we get to where we're going, we don't lose it because we blew it due to integrity. Does that make sense? So God's plan for you is not just for you to get there. It's for you to get there with the right heart and the right spirit and the right attitude. Because over time, at some point, Israel went into the promise as a nation. A lot of the people that rejected God and backbit against God didn't, but they got there. At some point, you're going to get to the promised land. Have you ever noticed in the Christian church, everybody's trying to go to the promised land? No one ever actually makes it. We're all believing God for our promise. You know what I mean? Like, my promise is over there. I'm working toward it. I'm working toward it. How about the promise is right now going on in your life? The promise is heaven is open and Jesus is open and the Father's open and the Spirit's open. And all you got to do is go position yourself before him because he's going to do it anyway. And then, look, when you do that, God will give you exactly what you need, when you need it, how you need it. And if you really trust him, see, this is the question of faith and trust. We really, 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 really trust him. That means everything that happens we're trusting is filtered through his loving fingers because he is our God. He doesn't add anything to me and then add sorrow with it, right? He is good and he's faithful. Even when we're faithless, 2 Timothy says he is faithful because he can't deny himself. Now, let's go to, um, so we see here Jesus, right, is the one who opens the doors. Now, we know of doors. Um, uh, we read in Acts last week. We know that God opened a door. He, he closed one door, by the way, to ministry for Paul and his team. He opened another door. Why? Well, Lord, I thought you called us to go to all people. God didn't have Paul and his team go to them. Right? God cares about those people, but that wasn't Paul's call at the time. Does that make sense? So again, where God calls you is going to look different. You're going to go, wait a second, God. And he's going to say, no, I want you to go over here. I promise you what God was doing in Noah's life did not look like you know, the greatest thing sometimes. Right? In other words, Noah preached for 120 years. Only eight people got saved. 
Okay? How did that, how, do, how was Noah's church working, by the way? Okay? By our standards today, Noah, Noah was a very unsuccessful pastor because he preached for 120 years and only eight people ever gave their life to Christ and they got in the boat. And yet, if it weren't for Noah, you don't exist today, right? It, God, what God does for you and in your life is so much more elevated in his thought process than ours. So you have to trust him. Because what looks sometimes like I'm going backward in the natural is God setting me up in the spiritual. You with me? All right, so let's look at John uh, uh, 10. John 10. And let's read the words, John 10, 9. Okay, let's read the words of the Lord Jesus. So he says this statement, I am. It's one of his I am statements. I am that I am. Before Abraham was, I am. He says in, in uh, John 10, 9, I am the door. Anyone who enters through me will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture and uh, security. Now, we see here, and this is where I want to elevate your thinking tonight about doors, open or closed. There's only one door, and that door is in and through the person of the Lord Jesus in your life. So yes, is there a door of opportunities? Of course, we know the Bible says so. We read in Acts that God opened a door to Lydia's heart and she became saved. And then later God opened a door for Lydia to bring the team in and feed them and house them and all the above. So there are doors and types of doors. But any door you enter that you didn't enter through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ is the wrong door. Because he is the door. So you got to begin to position yourself and think in your mind, elevate your thinking by the word of God to go, okay, I'm not looking for doors. I'm looking for the door. Am I connected to the door? Because the door, he is the one by which I enter. You know, Hebrews 10 says it's by his flesh and by his blood, his flesh. The Bible says this, the flesh is, his flesh is the veil by which we enter into the holy place. Now he's the door. Everything I need, everything I'm going to go through, everything in the kingdom that I need. See, listen, if it's not about Jesus, we don't want it anyway as believers. And the problem is sometimes in the church, we accept, well, God, you know, I'm just tired of waiting, right? Honestly, Lord, I'll take anything at this point. I'll take any partner at this point. You know what I mean? They don't have to fit, you know, half the list. I've ch I, I crossed that off because it ain't happening apparently. God, I'll take this man or God, I'll take this woman or God, I'll do this or I'll do this thing. Okay. When we settle, it shows that we aren't in the place of trust or we're being impatient because God has a timing for us that's perfect. If you believe that, see, we say it, God's timing's perfect. His timing is just perfect as we grit our teeth and we're like angry with him because he's not coming through and it doesn't seem like it's happening the way I want him to. Do you not understand? Do you not get what I'm saying to you? Do you not understand my needs? His timing is not my timing and thank God it's not because I'm so dumb like a sheep. Okay. I don't understand half of what he wants to do in my life because he's so much greater and bigger than anything I could think of, right? Leslie will tell you the story. If, if she had it originally, now, she has never, ever in any way been up, like, we're so grateful we got this baby girl in the way. We talk about her every day. But when the word came forth from our friend, Prophet David, that he saw a fourth baby in our lives and a daughter, Leslie... She'll tell you the story. She confronted him in the foyer. Wait a second now, prophet. <laughs> I don't know. Do you know I'm still nursing baby number three right now? Okay, God, wait, what do you mean another baby? God, do you know how hard it is to go? You see what I'm saying? Because we sometimes in the flesh, we got to get into the place where we yield anyway because we trust him, Right? And she has totally done that. She loves this little, we're so excited, right? We can't be more blessed. But I told Leslie, imagine if we didn't have her in our lives. We wouldn't even know what we're missing, but we'd be missing something so good. Imagine if we didn't have Benjamin running around like my little mini me with the blonde hair and the blue eyes in her house, hitting his siblings or throwing something around. And we're like, Lord, you know, this kid, guess what? We would miss so much. We wouldn't even know what we're missing, because he wouldn't be there, but God's goodness has overtaken us if we just yield and say, God, I trust your timing. His goodness is so much better 
as our friend on base said tonight, his goodness is so much better. You got to believe God for the goodness of God that it surpasses anything you could think of as good. Because in your mind, good and in God's mind, good are two different things. Right? So God, we don't want good, we want God. So Jesus said, I am the door. So from now on, when you walk about going, God, please open this door. See, the year of open doors for you, and I believe this is the beginning of of a rolling process in many of your lives where you're going to begin by faith because of the word that you're receiving by faith. Okay, this is his word. If you grab it, if you hold it, if you cling to it, then guess what? It's life to your bones and to your flesh. And next thing you know, you're walking in faith and not in fear. Next thing you know, you might even be just start confessing it. You know, oh, there's an I thought. You might just start saying, hey, God, I believe your word. And now over, over this situation, I'm going to declare God's promises. Yeah, I know I don't have any of that manifesting in my life today. I know I'm still sick in my body, but you said you would heal me. And so I claim my healing. By the way, when we're sick, this is just a parenthetical insertion here. When we're sick, and let's say our arm's broken, okay, it is not biblical to say my arm is not broken in Jesus' name. If you got an x-ray and your arm's broken, it's okay to say my arm is broken. But by faith, I'm believing the God who heals me to heal my broken bone. Does that make sense? Faith isn't denying a thing exists. Faith is in the face of the thing existing, not accepting that is the final outcome, but I declare the promise of God over that thing. Right? So a lot of times you'll hear people who can't even confess you know, that they have cancer because, well, I don't claim it. Well, you don't have to claim it and own it and put a name tag on it. Okay. You can just say, look, this is what has been diagnosed in my physical body, but I claim the promise of Yeshua in my life that this cancer is not stronger than the blood. Does that make sense? So I cannot heal and address something. Uh, I can't heal it if I never address it. It's the same thing with our emotions. If you act like you don't have any trauma or pain or, or you haven't gone through something in your soul, you can't be healed of it. If I don't acknowledge in the same context, if I don't acknowledge my sin, I can never be forgiven of it. You see what I'm saying? The Bible says in 1 John that if I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me. But it comes from confessing to whom? A, a priest in a box? No. I don't want to know all your stuff anyway. Okay? Unless you want to share something with me that we'll pray over. Otherwise, I don't want to know all your details. Okay? We're not the Catholic church here. Okay? You take it because there is no in-between person necessary for you to have a mediator because Jesus became the mediator. Right? So you go to God and you say, God, I blew this one. And he's going to smile at you because he loves you and go, I oh, know. I already know that about you. Right? And you've blown it a thousand times. And guess what? Because you're confessing it, because you're asking for my mercy, because you've come boldly to my throne of grace to obtain mercy and find help in time of need, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to take that sin as far as the east is from the west, and I'm going to remove it from you. I'm going to even one-up that, and I'm going to go ahead and throw it in a sea of forgetfulness, which means I forget it as God. God can forget stuff if he chooses to, because he does not hold against us our sin in and through Christ. Isn't that's the beauty of the gospel. That is it. He doesn't hold. Wait, you mean I can come before you with righteous robes and and, and white garments and innocence again, even though my innocence was lost a long time ago in this world because of Jesus? Absolutely. He takes off my filthy garments and he puts on robes of righteousness on me. I've become the righteousness of God in Christ, in Christ. So everything in my life is in Christ. He is the door. So let's go to Philippians, all right? Philippians 3, and let's read Paul's word to the church of Philippi. Here, uh, uh, last week we saw in Acts 16, uh, Paul was called to the Macedonian region. Uh, we call it the Macedonian call in theology, where he saw the vision and ended up in this Roman colony in this major city hub called Philippi. Right? And of course, we know the things. He faced much persecution there, by the way. But later, had he not had this church in, in uh, uh, Philippians, this book was written. It's one of the most joyous books in the Bible. He's writing it from prison. He writes about the Philippians and his great joy because they're sowing into his ministry. They're blessing him. And all. Imagine had God not opened the door for him to go to Philippi in the first place. Philippi, the Philippians, were one of the churches that supported him when other churches weren't, that he planted, Right? They were taking care of his needs, 
even though he hadn't seen them in a while. So, so God opens everything. Now, God opened the door for him to go to Philippi and not just plant a church, but to get beaten with rods and thrown in jail, right? Now, that, that doesn't seem like a God door to me, okay? Uh, well, that doesn't seem like a God door because God only wants to ever put me in comfortable situations, right? Because that's what the word says, right? He only will ever put you in comfortable situations that make you feel good and safe, right? Oh, okay. I, I, you're right. I didn't read that anywhere. I read where God might lead you into a lion's den. I read where God might lead you into a pit sometimes God, so that he can end up putting you in the palace at some point. I read where through Hebrews that some were delivered from the power of the sword and others were cut in half, right? That's the gospel. The gospel is we're walking this thing out and trusting him that whatever the path, whatever the door, it's your door because you're the door. Right? Let's see what Paul said in Philippians uh, 3 7. But whatever former things were gain to me, gains, these things I once regarded as advancements in merit. This is the Amplified. I've come to consider as loss, meaning absolutely worthless for the sake of Christ. But more than that, I count everything as loss compared to the priceless privilege and supreme advantage of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He goes on to say, for his sake, meaning Jesus' sake, I have lost everything and I consider it all garbage that I may gain Christ. In other words, any door in your life that you ever get open or opens to you that isn't through the door is garbage anyway. And even if it's fleeting and it's good for a little bit, trust me, it'll be like gravel in your mouth at some point, right? Just like it says in Proverbs, because if, if it was ill-gotten gain, meaning whatever the advancement was, now Paul spent his whole life in, in, um, in religion, in getting every achievement you could think of, a, a Benjamite circumcised on the eighth day, a Hebrew of Hebrews, uh, according to the law, he was blameless. He was so zealous for the law that he persecuted the way these wacko cult people. See, today Christianity is the norm in our country. Back then it was a cult right? Back then, it was like a cult. It was not the, the cool religion to be a part of. Now we all like social club it, you know, and we kind of walk around. We're like, oh, you're a Christian. You're a Christian. I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. I don't obey him. I'm shacked with my girlfriend, but I love Jesus, right? We all, that's our culture today. And back then, okay, back then, it was, if you're a part of the way, we're going to beat you, stone you, throw you in prison, and then you find out if you really have faith, if you really believe, right? So Paul said, in other words, all these, remember, he threw it all away. Paul threw every door that he had ever opened in his own life, he threw it away for Jesus. He had the chance to be at the top of the top. Pharisees were the most respected in all of Israel. They were the most trusted. They were the most honored. They were praised throughout the streets. Jesus said they used to love to parade around and get honor from men, right? And they would... Throw little pieces of tithe out there, right? As they devoured widows and orphans and houses and all the above, right? Okay. Um, Paul had the opportunity to be in the most elevated of society. It's reminiscent and reminds me of a man named Moses who had the chance to be in Pharaoh's court. And the Bible says he considered the suffering worth it for the Christ, Right? In other words, we got to check ourselves as the saints of God to say, okay, have I really said, Lord, does that mean I give away all my stuff? No, 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 no. What it means is whatever God says to me, okay, get rid of or add to or go here or go here, that's what I obey. Paul said in the beginning of, of the book, uh, Paul, a servant of Christ, that word servant in the Greek actually means like a slave to. Because I have, I have made myself, I was a free man when I came into Christ, and yet I've enslaved myself. I have yoked myself to him so much so that he is my master, and I obey everything he says. That's what Adonai means, is master and ruler, right? So Paul said, whatever it is, so no matter what you can get in your life, no matter what you're chasing, no matter where it comes from, no matter how good it looks, right, you will have opportunity to deny the Christ. Oh, you would never say it with your mouth, but you do it with your actions. We do it with getting into the situation that, that deep down in our hearts we know really isn't the right situation, but it's an open door now and I need it now, God, right? 
And then we later cry out to God because we screwed everything up and got in a mess. And most of what we cry out about, a lot of what we cried about, we did and we got into because we weren't listening in the first place. Because when we do finally approach God and his throne, we spend all of our time telling him about every need we have. When the Bible says he already knows what your needs are. And we spend all our time doing this and we do none of our time doing this. We're not listening at all. Jesus said in that verse in uh, John 10, that my sheep in that same chapter, preceding the verse I read, he said, my sheep will know my voice. You don't have to worry about the wrong door or the wrong place at the wrong time when you're just plugged into him. Okay. And I wish getting saved once meant that I'm plugged in eternally and I never, meaning in this life, and I never ever have to spend any time and never have to discipline my body and beat it and bring it in a subjection. I wish it meant that I never had to study my Bible or, or do anything because it just all was there. Unfortunately, the Bible says the opposite of that. It teaches us that we're saved absolutely and holy. And at the same time, I have to renew my mind. I have to constantly renew it according to what? The word. Okay, I have to be uh, transformed by it. Transformed means I'm continually in a process of being renewed. Paul also says be renewed in your spiritual mind, right? Constantly being renewed. All right, let's go to Galatians. Let's go to Galatians. I want to go to Galatians 2 and, and verse 20. Okay. Here's what it says. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And this life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So let's back up. I have been crucified with Christ. Okay? That means, all right, I literally have shared in, did you go get on a cross and get beaten and put on a cross? How have you been crucified with Christ? In the spiritual realm you have been crucified when you identify with Christ because as much as you identify with his glory, you have to identify with his suffering. The Bible tells us that, that the glory that he's prepared for us is unlike anything any eye has seen nor ear heard, and yet we have to learn obedience through the suffering in which Christ suffered. So we will suffer, right? The false prosperity gospel that people attack is just simply that. That's the problem is somewhere it got off track from God wants to prosper you to, you'll never go through anything bad. The truth is God absolutely wants to prosper you because he says it over and over and over and over and over again. But he also might lead me into a place and a village where people are hostile and I got to get let out with a basket out of the window. You see what I'm saying? So that's the true gospel. God wants to prosper you. But here Paul is saying, I've been crucified. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. If you look at your life this way and you meditate on this verse this week, you'll recognize, look, the doors I'm seeking, half of them right now, if I were to put the doors out there and go, God, you know, I'm seeking things I want. I'm really not acting dead to my own self and my own life and my own desires and my own wants. You know, again, he says he'll give you the desires of your heart. Does this contradict this? No. What Paul is saying here is that I have decided that I don't even live anymore. It's Christ living in me, which means if Christ wants to heal somebody, then I should be the hand that reaches out and just says in Jesus' name, be healed. I got to trust the Christ to do the work. I can't heal anybody. And I keep doing it, and I keep doing it, and I keep doing it, and I keep doing it. Why? Because Christ lives in me. If, does Christ live in us? Of course he does. But have we died to ourselves? Because if you want to see God in the place of provision collide with your life and collide with you in open doors and opportunities, you get to the place where you say, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And that means whatever the Christ wants, that's what he gets. It's Christ in the morning, Christ in the evening, Jesus in the middle of the day, Jesus on my lunch break, okay? Does it mean you don't take your kids to school and do your business and do your job? No, it just means in the midst of all these things, can I wait on the glory mountain my whole life and never have to deal with society? No, that's not what it says. What it says is it's no longer I who live. So why do I get so offended every time somebody does something to me? I get get so offended. Why? Why? Well, because I'm living. It's my life. See, I just, I just laid down Christ for a minute and I picked up myself. Now we got to have a talk because you, you hurt my feelings. You offended me. All right? I'm, the church is so offended all the time, by the way. Come on, let's grow up. 
right? Why? Because, because it's no longer Christ who lives in me, but I who live in myself, and you just offended me, brother, let me tell you, okay? I'm not going back to that church because that pastor said something that hurt my feelings, right? Okay, you see what I'm saying? If Christ really lives in me, then I'm dead to my own opinions, my own way of thinking, my own thoughts, my own processes, and I replace it with the Christ because he is the door, not doors, the door. And when I'm in him, the, the door opens every other door that I'll ever need open. And the door shuts every other door that I need shut. And there are doors that sometimes we've opened in our lives that I can't shut by myself. I need him to shut the door. I need him to close the door, right? So he is the door. You got to die. You got to die. Paul said, I die every day. I die daily because death is a process for the body. I wish that we just died once, okay? Meaning, again, metaphorically, the Bible tells us we will die once, right? It's appointed to us physically to die once, okay? But Paul's saying, again, metaphorically, spiritually, every day I die. Because every day there's a part of me that picks myself back up and says, Jesus, you sit on the sideline on this one. I got this, okay? Let me handle this thing. And then next thing you know, you're sweating and you're striving and you're laboring and nothing's happening. You've heard me say it, but a thousand, a thousand days of my labor isn't worth one day of his favor. I can't accomplish in a thousand days of my own labor what one moment of his favor can do in my life. One moment of his favor can open doors that, that I never, ever, ever could have opened in a million years. So do you want the door opening your doors? Or do you want to run around pulling on every handle that you see in your life? Okay, because you can kick, you can pry. Look, if you want a king more than you want him, he'll finally let you have a king. Right? We see that in the Bible. He'll let you have it at some point. He'll let you have it. You just get him, and then next thing you know, he's made all your sons and daughters slaves. He's taking your livestock. I mean, what did the prophet say was going to happen? But you had to have a king. I'm your king, he says. If you just wait on me, I'll be everything you ever need. Everything we need is in Christ. All my healing is in Christ. All my provision is in Christ. All, all my blessing is in Christ. All my character development is in Christ. All my silversmith refining as I'm getting melted down uh, in the fire is in Christ. All my suffering is in Christ. My glory is in Christ. Everything I have is in and through and because and for and by Jesus Christ. And that right there is the kind of position you're in Christ. What does that mean? It means the word in in the Greek means I am fixed in a time or place and position. Fixed. It denotes no motion, that word in the Greek. I've, I've taught on that in, in our messages. They're on YouTube. But if you go see that word in, it means it's not, it's not denoting any kind of motion. It's a fixed position where I'm steady and I'm still and I'm in Christ. You're in Christ when you don't feel like you're in Christ. Okay? You see that? But the way I become aware of being in and with and dying to myself is I have to crucify this life and this self. Jesus said, if you find your life, you're going to lose it. But if you're willing to lose your life for what? Just for, to lose it? No, for my sake. If you're willing to say it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, then let me tell you, right, provision isn't a big deal. Right? right now, it feels like a big deal. And there's not days that don't, don't go by where I don't go, God, I got to get on my face before the Lord and start quoting words on, on, on you know, blessing financially or blessing healing, whatever it is, because you're always going to run up against a new giant and a new obstacle. Doesn't mean you've already obtained or figured out. What it means is I know where to run every time. I know where to run. And let me tell you, if you just say, God, I only want your doors and any doors in my life, future, past, present, you name it, any doors in my life that aren't yours, I'm yielding to you and I'm asking you to shut those doors and open only God doors, then let me tell you, your life is on that track of, I know the plans I think towards you, saith the Lord, to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. And in the Hebrew, that word means an expected end. Expected because from the foundation of the world, God the Father has expected for you this precious end, this significant life, right? Right? He wants your life to count. He doesn't just want you to count the number of your days. He wants your life to count, your moments to count, what you do to count. It should count. Why? Where? For eternity, because it's done in and through him. 
And if you'll just do that, let me tell you, if you'll surrender to that, you're going to go around and you're going to be such a blessing, right? Because all of a sudden you get out of yourself. You realize it's better to give than to receive. You know, we were talking about this the other day, uh, myself and I think a group of ministers. But the truth is, okay, you don't ever stand up as a minister perfectly healed, perfectly whole, perfectly have it all together. It doesn't work that way. Right? What you do is you get up in faith and you do what God's called you to do and he heals you as you go. He, he increases you as you go. He teaches you as you go. None of you will ever feel qualified and feel ready to do what he's called you to do. You just have to do it because he is your qualification. He is your authorization. You see what I'm saying? It never, ever, ever will start if you wait to be perfect at it. Okay. So you got to get out there and do it. Again, this word on waiting on the Lord is not, I don't do any labor and do any work and don't do any pushing. The difference is when I finally get to the place where I labor, my labor, go, my labor produces something I couldn't produce because I've been over here waiting. When other people were striving, striving, and plowing, I was busy plowing in, in, in prayer and in relationship and in fellowship. And then all of a sudden, God just makes these connections in your life and opens Holy Spirit doors. And, and you see it in little places at your job, in little places, you're like, oh, wow, God, you can see the hand of the Lord in these things. That's called favor because you're walking in a place of obedience. Obedience begets the favor of God. You have his unmerited favor through Christ, but as you walk in obedience, you know, many of you are waiting for that next instruction, but you didn't obey the last one. So go to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I remember you said, please forgive me for that. And Lord, I just help me. I want to obey you. Okay. So give me an instruction, Lord. The next thing you say, I'll obey it. Right. Even when it's uncomfortable, even when I don't like it, even when it doesn't look good, even when it's going to embarrass me in front of my friends or my coworkers or people in Walmart or whatever's going on. Right. Okay. God, God is less concerned about our reputation as he is about souls and people's lives that are on the line, that are, that are getting, being victimized by the enemy everywhere we go. And you have the authority and the ability and the word and the life and the zoe life of Jesus that you got to start releasing and letting loose where you're at. And how do you fill up? The Bible says, be ye filled. I wish I could have got just filled one time, you know, and then I never had to worry right at him. We never have to worry about it again. We're just full. But guess what? I got to get, be ye filled. And an empty vessel cannot pour out anything to somebody. But as I get filled, where? With wine? No, with the spirit. Okay, with medications, with entertainment. Entertainment is medication, by the way. There's nothing wrong with entertainment. Okay, but when it takes the place of relationship, then it becomes a medication and an idol. Right? that I'm just doling down my senses and myself. So I get before the Lord, I get with the Lord, and then guess what? He begins to do what Philippians 1.6 says. He who began, he began it, he'll complete it. He, be, he began it, he completes it. In the process, you know, beginning is a start and the completion's an end. So what happens in the middle? That means he's doing it along the way. I can do all things through Christ. Who? What? empowers, strengthens, energizes me to do it. Amen.